first reading for this morning is Genesis chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw that the light was good. And God separated light from darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning, the first day. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is Romans chapter 6, verses 1 through 11. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried therefore with him by baptism, by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin, for one who has died has been set free from sin. Now if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. We continue with our next hymn, The People That in Darkness Sat. rise. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the very first chapter. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And when he came up out of the water, immediately he saw the heavens opening and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, You are my beloved Son, with you I am well pleased. This is the Gospel of the Lord.
Please be seated. In the name of the one who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Perhaps you are sick of it every year around this time, at the time when we read about Jesus being baptized, you get a message about infant baptism. But you know what? It seems like a good thing. Why? Because it is one of those things that is different in the Lutheran church than the other Protestant Lutheran of the other Protestant churches around them especially the largest Protestant denomination in the United States, the Southern Baptist Convention. They don't believe infant baptism is right. Plus, it's not unusual for people to ask Lutherans, why do you baptize infants? And it is also not unusual for the Lutheran to respond, I don't know, ask my pastor. Or they might give this answer, that's just what we do. That can make Lutherans look rather dumb. And it can make them look like they are members of a church that they don't really know what that church believes. It can also make it look like your faith has a foundation in our tradition. We just do what we do instead of your faith being based on biblical foundation. And that's not a good thing. We want what we believe and practice in the church to match up with scripture. Besides this, as a pastor, something else has happened over the years when I've been a pastor. Infant baptism is one of those things that actually keeps people from joining the Lutheran church, especially if they come from a different Protestant denomination. It is hard for them to accept infant baptism. So let's get into this crazy doctrine. Why do we baptize infants in the Lutheran church? The number one reason, and you can always pull out this reason. This is the number one reason, and you shouldn't have to go any further than this. Because the Lord Jesus Christ tells us to. He says, go and make disciples of all nations baptizing and teaching baptizing and teaching Jesus does not say make disciples of all nations except the littlest people in those nations he says all nations which means every person of the nations including infants one other thing here you must never forget that Christ says baptizing and teaching by the way, many adults, parents, try to play the game of having a child be baptized, but then they put no effort into having the child be taught any of the teachings of Jesus Christ. That is similar to saying, hey, I have this Reese's peanut butter cup that has no peanut butter in it. You know what? Then it's not a Reese's peanut butter cup. If you are about discipling, it just can't be about baptism. Jesus put the two together, baptizing and teaching. And if there's baptism, but no teaching, that's not discipling. It's baptizing and teaching. But anyways, that is the number one reason. Jesus told us to make disciples, to disciple and how is that done? By baptizing and teaching. And there's no exception. Baptizing and teaching all nations, including infants. Otherwise, we don't know what the word all nations means. The second reason that the Lutheran Church baptizes infants is this, is that infants need the forgiveness of sins found in baptism, that is given in baptism. And before I go further, please always know this, the forgiveness of sins that God has placed with the word and the water in baptism is the forgiveness of sins that Jesus Christ won through his great sacrifice on the cross and was proclaimed in his resurrection. It is not two different forgivenesses. It is that forgiveness, 
But in baptism, God is specifically telling through water and the word that person, identifying that person as one who Christ died for, who Christ rose for. And this forgiveness is for that person. It is a personal communication of God's forgiveness to that person. A lot of times people go, you know, I believe I'd be saved if I just could uh, see a sign. Maybe if I could find my name in the Bible, I would know I was saved and that my sins are forgiven. I always think that's a bunch of baloney because I'm going to tell you something. My name is Jonathan Schrader, and I've Googled my name before, and there's a lot of Jonathan Schraders in the world. So even if it said Jonathan Schrader in the Bible, I wouldn't know it was me, Jonathan Schrader. Maybe it's Jonathan Schrader from New Mexico. Maybe, it's, uh, maybe the language is wrong, and it's Juan Schrader. <laughs> maybe it's Johann Schruder. I don't know, but there's a lot of people. It could be Jonathan Schrader from 1920. Is it Jonathan Schrader from, though, 2021? You wouldn't know. But at baptism, let there be no doubt about it. The water goes on you. Your sins are washed away. And once again, it's not a magic trick. The pastor doesn't produce more forgiveness. He is getting to you the forgiveness that Jesus won for you on the cross and applying it to you. It's God doing the baptizing, but he uses the pastor's hands, uses the pastor's mouth to make sure that you get that forgiveness. But that is such a special thing that the forgiveness of sins is promised in baptism and the children need that. Surely I was born in iniquity, says uh, King David in Psalm 51 verse 5. Surely I was born in iniquity in sin. Did my mother conceive me? I was a sinner even from conception. Even when I was born, I was a sinner, says David. And we shouldn't think, oh, that's David. I'm better than David. Nope. What David says of himself applies to all of humanity. And besides that, we know the words, the words that Christian churches glory in all through the centuries. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. All. It doesn't say all except infants. It says all have sinned. You have no right to change that into saying all except infants. Because the next verses too say that Jesus then has paid the ransom for that all, including infants. You know, Michael Horvath, he's here today. He told me, uh, two months ago in Bible class, he said, Pastor, I got the number one evidence that babies are sinners. And I said, what is that, Michael? And he said, it's because infants can die, can't they? And that's true. And we just went over that in church, didn't we? The wages of sin is death. If you were perfect, you wouldn't die. Theologically speaking, the only reason why Jesus died is because he took on the sins of the world. If he didn't do that, Nobody could have killed him, but he took on the sins of the world. The wages of sin is death. And I thought to Michael, I think you're right. I think that is good evidence. Anyways, but some churches don't believe that. They do not believe that babies are sinners. Some believe that babies are born innocent and they don't need the forgiveness of sins. Others say, well, uh, God will, they might sin, but God will not charge any sins against them until they hit an age of accountability. Both these things aren't biblical. Age of accountability is crazy. Where does that come from in the Bible at all? But anyways, some people really believe it. What really is going on here is people are using their reason and letting it invade their biblical teaching. You look at the baby, oh, so cute, so beautiful, oh, he's innocent. But that's not what the scripture proclaims. It proclaims all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We think, how could a child sin? They're innocent. <coughs> they just, they, they learn the sin. 
but they wouldn't learn it so well unless it was already there with them. I know plenty of people who've said, Pastor, I say a lot of good words, but the minute I say a bad word, that's the word my kid copies and says. Why is that? There's something in us that's wrong. Anyways, many churches don't believe that children need the forgiveness of sins, and they don't even believe that the forgiveness of sins is in baptism. And lastly, why does the Lutheran Church baptize infants? Because it believes that the Holy Spirit can work faith in anyone, even infants. We're not going to put any limits to the Holy Spirit. We know that the Holy Spirit works through baptism. We bring a child to the baptism font or a dunking tank, it doesn't matter, with the hope that the Holy Spirit will work faith in that child's heart through baptism. We know the Holy Spirit has the power to do that. Now, some churches will say you can't do that. It needs to be a believer's baptism. You see, because a baby can't understand, so the baby should not be baptized. They need to already be a believer. The unfortunate problem with that is this, is that it appears that they do not see the forgiveness of sins. Well, they don't see the forgiveness of sins at all but they do not believe that faith is a supernatural gift of God. They believe that it is some kind of intellectual ability or cognitive ability, or else why would you say it? A child can't understand, so how can you baptize it? That's the logic. A child can't understand, so you shouldn't baptize the baby. What's interesting is that when a person's baptized in any Christian church, what do they say? They say, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Nobody understands the Trinity, everybody. Nobody does. And if you're saying you can, you're a liar. And yet that's the name who we get baptized into, and you're saying that you need to understand it? Nobody can understand it. Not a baby, not a 90-year-old man, not a 48-year-old pastor. Faith is a complete supernatural gift of God. Just because you've got a great score on your ACT doesn't mean you have faith. No, it is not some sort of mental gymnastic. Faith is a miracle every time it happens. Now, a person might say, well, Pastor, do you really know that every child who gets baptized has faith? Actually, I don't. The truth is, is that you can preach to the world and a lot of people aren't going to believe. And you can baptize a person and they might not believe. Even if they're an adult, they might be lying because they just want to join your church. Nobody really can say for certain, everybody who's baptized gets faith. That doesn't mean we don't stop doing it. And what did we already say today? How did Jesus say you're supposed to disciple? Baptizing and teaching. And this is one of the reasons why we have sponsors. It's not just an honorary title. It is something to say, oh, I am going to make sure that you grow up learning that you were baptized. I was actually there. You were baptized. God personally promised the forgiveness of sins to you, the forgiveness that he won on the cross. And that matters. That means you're God's child right now this very second believe it and then live it sometimes people don't live like they're a child of god remind that child of that you don't have to just remind them about birthdays you can also remind them that they were uh, baptized in fact don't get them anything for their birthday get them something for their baptism that'll freak them out but it'll be kind of nice it'll be a couple weeks probably later okay oh i get another gift but show them that their baptism mattered you were there. You were the God parent. You were the sponsor. If it's just an honorary title, what does that really do? It gets you in a picture. That's about it. Just one more instance to explain that to you. 
When I was born, you know what my dad did? He bought me some stock. I won't tell you what it is, but you know what? I didn't even know about it. But that didn't mean that I wasn't getting dividends. And by the time I actually f knew about it and believed that it actually happened, I had some money in the bank. And it was all because of my dad. Now, that didn't mean I had to be baptized again. I mean, I didn't mean that I had that uh, my dividends didn't exist until I understood it or believed it. It was always there. Because a dividend really pretty much is a promise that keeps on accruing and accruing and accruing. And it's the same thing with baptism. Even if you didn't remember it, it's still there. And it still can be a blessing to you in the future, but only if you believe it. Once again, not that you intellectually understand it, because nobody can understand Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. But if you believe that at baptism, that one who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit said, you are my child, and I am your God, and I take care of my children. That's what's going on in baptism. Baptism is a great thing, and we believe it's a great thing for infants, because in the end, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And that world includes infants too. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We now continue by confessing our faith in the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the words of